हेलो ऑल नमो बुद्धा जय भीम आई एम हियर टू इंट्रोड्यूस माय धम्मा सिस्टर धम्मचारिणी वज्रथारा शी इज ऑर्डर इन 2004 एंड इन द पास्ट शी वर्क इन बुद्धिस्ट राइट लालूड यूवलेशन शॉप शी शी वाज अ मित्र कन्वीनर इन शेफील्ड also she work in women's ordination team based in uk at the moment she work with the triyatna retreat triyatna loka retreat center helping women from all over europe europe to get ordained and also she is a chair of india dharma trust also she wrote module in mitra study making dr babasa ambedkar known in the west so i uh, personally i am so happy and uh, i'm very much looking forward to hear from my dharma sister so uh, i i would like to invite dharma charini vajratara to give a talk on baba sahib so please vajratara you can start your talk thank you so much thank you sri dipta and uh, namo bodhai jai bim So one of the things I've been very lucky with in my life is that I've been all over India on pilgrimage. I've been to Bodh Gaya, Sarnath, Savati. I've been to Kusinara. I've been to all the great places of pilgrimage. But there's one place left that I haven't been, um, and that I would very much like to go to. So when this lockdown happened in the UK and in India. one of the first things i thought was will i be able to make this one last pilgrimage and this pilgrimage that i would like to make is to go to a particular bench in gujarat in kamati bag um and it's not because the bench is particularly uh, remarkable it's not made out of precious stones or marble uh, it's not in any of the guide books that one might get from the uk but this bench something very very profound happened because on this bench a bodhisattva made his vow and when this lockdown is over if i have the chance to go to india again i would like to go to this bench and i would like to place my head on the ground at the feet of where this bodhisattva made his vow because it was here that baba saheb ambedkar made his vow not to rest until he had helped others uh not to rest until he had liberated his people from the monster of inequality of caste and it was at this bench that he decided to devote his life to the welfare and happiness of all beings starting with his own people So I'd like uh this evening to talk about what happened uh at that place in Gujarat um when two in a way great forces came together and the great forces were um suffering adverse conditions dukkha great difficulty and also faith faith in the person of Baba Saheb Ambedkar So some of you know that um uh baba saheb ambedkar's name is um bimrao which also means fearsome one he was a substantial being and when he met with this adverse circumstances he could hold both those adverse circumstances and his faith and something even greater than his faith and the suffering that he experienced was born something great was born at that moment so i'd like to look at what were the conditions for that and um, what was born uh at that place in 1918 so i know that uh, most of you watching this will know who baba saheb uh, is and was and you'll know the story of his life as no some of you will know it very well and some of you who are watching may not know because i know there's some people uh in in the west who might be watching so i will just uh, remind you of um the conditions that led up to that experience on the bench so baba saheb was born into um a scheduled caste what was known at that time as as the untouchables 
um, untouchable caste, which meant that um, in uh, that system of inequality, uh, that particular caste was um, known as being untouchable by members of the higher castes. So it was a system of graded inequality um, and a very, very humiliating and destructive system. But though Baba Seb was born into that caste, um, he had got an education. He was the first person from his background to matriculate from high school. And part of that was because he had such encouragement from his father who enabled him to have an education and really encouraged him to study more deeply. So um, he said that his father used to wake him up at two o'clock in the morning uh, just to study, just to um, keep going over what he had learned at school and to pass his exams. And it was very, very difficult for Baba Seb because um, even at school he was uh, ostracized, he was humiliated because of his background. He was made to sit on a, a piece of sackcloth at the back of the classroom. He couldn't drink or eat with his fellow students. Um, but he had incredible strength of will to just survive that, to just get an education, even under the most demanding and humiliating circumstances. And he was very lucky because um, there, was, uh, there were people in his life who recognized that this child was brilliant. This child really, really could go somewhere. And he had the sponsorship of the Maharaja of Baroda uh, or Vadodara now, as is now called in Gujarat. And through this sponsorship of the Maharaja of Baroda, um, he uh, went to Columbia University in the United States of America and got a master's degree in the arts and a PhD um, from Columbia University. And he went on to study at the London School of Economics. And it was at this point that he had to come back to India because he ran out of funds. So he said of himself that he'd had five years of um, living in the West, in the United States and London, and that he, um, he had experienced um, a life of just being a student, of being a student, a very intelligent student, a very dedicated student, and um, uh, which had enabled him to uh, get further in his studies. But he wasn't known as um, someone from the untouchable caste or scheduled caste. He had a relatively free life. But he felt he had a duty, though he had many offers in the West and he could have had a very, very easy life in the West um, because of his uh, great education and, um, and devotion to study and very, very intelligent. Um, he could have had a comfortable life in the West, but he came back to India, um, came back to Baroda in, in Gujarat to work for the government in Baroda um, so that he could, um, in a way, repay his debt. Something about Dr. Ambeke is very, very ethical man. You know, no one ever doubted his ethics. And I think he felt some responsibility to give back to the Maharaja of Baroda because the Maharaja of Broda had, had sponsored him. So he came back to uh, India in 1980. Um, but as soon as he stepped off the train um, at Broda station, he realized he had a problem. And he had a problem because he didn't know where he was going to live while he worked for the, for the government there. Because he was from this particular caste, and um, he had friends in Baroda, but funnily enough, you know, when it came to the, uh, to, to the possibility of him, him actually living with them, they vanished, you know, they let him down again and again. And he went from place to place to see if he could stay at a guest house, but no one would accept him. In the end, he got a room in, the, in a Parsi guest house, uh, which he thought, well, they don't practice caste, so maybe I'll have a room here. But as soon as the, um, the, guest, the person who ran the guest house, the guest house manager, realized that he wasn't really a Parsi, um, he gave him, uh, he needed the money, so he was willing to take him anyway. But he made him sleep in this big hall, which had bats, which had mice, 
um, which was full of old furniture. He gave him the worst place in the whole building to live. And it was here that Dr. Ambedkar had to start his work, living in a hall surrounded by bats, mice, in very unclean um, and desperately lonely conditions. And when he went to work at the office, that was no better. Um, people even would throw the papers they had to give him uh, onto the floor or onto the desk so that they wouldn't have any physical contact with him. And he couldn't share the office uh, drinking water. People would exclude him from conversations. People would exclude him from decision making. So here he was in this desperate situation, terribly lonely, sleeping at night in this hall with the bats and the mice, um, not knowing uh, where he would uh, continue to stay. Um, his place of living included deception. He had to say that he was a Parsi to live there. And, um, and not having any friends in the world with him at that time. And he said when he was there, the only escape he had from his uh, very, very difficult situation was reading. And for a while he would read and he would get absorbed into what he was reading. And then he would realize at a particular time, um, suddenly realize where he was and in what, what a predicament, what a situation that he was in. And um, this went on. Uh, but eventually, um, one day he was, he was reading uh, in his room and a whole mob, a whole group of Parsis came um, to the guest house. They realized who he was and they came armed and prepared for violence to throw him out of um, the guest house. And here he was alone, not a friend in the world. Um, he'd been educated for five years in higher education in the West. Um, he had a remarkable determination and intelligence, um, remarkable dignity as a human being. And here he was faced with an armed uh, mob um, threatening to threatening violence unless he left. So of course he asked for time to pack up his things and said, yes, I will leave. But where was he to go? Um, no one would help him, no one could help him. And in the end, uh, he decided to go back to Mumbai, to Bombay on the train, and he had five hours to wait. So he went to Kamati Bagh, um, to this park in Gujarat and sat down on his bench, this bench. And here he was, he'd been a whole life of struggle, a whole life of determination to get what he, uh, where he was, a whole life of study, of having very little money, of having, using all of his resources um, to get an education and uh, even leaving in his family in quite a difficult situation financially. All this struggle um, to get an education, to better himself, a remarkably intelligent and dignified man. And he realized that in India, he was always going to be treated as less than, no matter what he did, no matter what education he had or job he had, he was always going to be treated as less than others because of his birth. So a lesser man would have just crumbled under that suffering, crumbled under that weight of um, realization of there was nowhere to go and no one who could help him. Um, but in Dr. Ambedkar, something else arose. It didn't break Ambedkar uh, to experience this level of suffering. What Ambedkar did is he thought about others. He thought, well, if I'm experiencing this kind of suffering, this kind of discrimination with all my education, with all my determination and with the help of my family, what about others? What about others in my situation? What about others in the same background as me? And he made that vow at that time, I will spend the rest of my life helping remove inequality. I will spend the rest of my life helping other people, helping my community. And if I die in the attempt, so be it. That is what I will spend my life doing. So this was a great moment, a great moment full of determination and um, resolve to really live one's life for the benefit of other beings, to live a good life and to live a life of meaning and value 
not just for himself, but for all beings. Um, sometimes this moment is called um, the Mahakalpa, which means uh, Mahasankalpa, which means the great determination, the great kind of vow or uh, resolve to um, help others. So what was happening? What was happening in Dr. Ambedkar's uh, internal life? Well, in a way, we don't know when he describes um, that situation, when he describes that moment in his life. He talks about it quite simply. He doesn't go into a lengthy explanation. But from reading his life, uh, life's work and from uh, understanding um, from the Buddhist perspective what might happen when we make this kind of vow, I think there's some conclusions that we can draw. So I think what happened was that uh, in, in the internal life of Dr. Ambedkar, this kind of struggle and this difficulty met a great faith. So in, uh, in the Buddhist uh, philosophy, it said that um, uh, it, with a great amount of struggle, with a great amount of adversity and difficulty, it, can, it has two options. You can either, it can either give rise to aversion and to hatred, or it can give rise to faith. And I think that because of uh, Dr. Ambedkar being such a substantial human being, such a dignified and wise human being, in, instead of having just great anger and hatred, what arose for him was faith. And what do I mean by faith? Well, I don't mean a kind of formal conversion to Buddhism. I don't think that's it at all. I think faith is a very natural human state. Um, in a way, uh, Dr. Ambedkar's faith is, is what made his conversion to Buddhism possible, uh, which happened later on in his life. It's not that converting to Buddhism made his faith possible. It's that his faith made um, converting to Buddhism possible, which means that he had a deep inner experience that he felt was reflected in the Buddhist teachings. And that's why he took up Buddhism later in his life. Um, actually, I think he was uh, took up Buddhism all through his life, but he wanted certain conditions to be met before he'd formally make that commitment. I think that's another story. But I think he could really had a really deep feel for reality. So this is what faith is. Um, Bhanti Sangharachita has talked about faith as what's ultimate in us resonating with what is ultimate in the universe. So it's a natural response to the way things are. It's not something imposed by a particular religious creed or doctrine. Um, in a way, faith is the natural expression of when three factors are present. Um, and those factors are wisdom, uh, love or maitri, and energy, and all of those things were present um, in Ambedkar as he took that vow on the bench in Gujarat. So I'd like to talk about those three factors and how they were present in the life of Dr. Ambedkar. So the first thing is um, his wisdom, uh, his understanding, uh, his understanding of the way things are. Because I think on that bench, he must have seen something he must have seen something very, very deeply, something even beyond words, something unexpressed, a deep truth, deep in his bones. And I think what he saw at that moment um, was a vision of humanity, that all humanity is one. What we tend to do is we tend to divide up humanity. We tend to divide um, people into caste or in in my culture, uh, class. Um, we tend to divide people into people we like or people we don't like. We divide people in terms of their nationality or their gender or their tribe or their race or their religion or their education or their language. We tend to put people in separate boxes and in separate um, categories. But I think what Dr. Ambedkar saw at that moment was that all categories, all boxes that we put into are created by mind. They're not really existent things. And some of them, uh, some of the ways that we categorize them work on a particular level. Um, 
some of them are completely artificial, like the like caste or class. But the problem is that we fix people into these things. We fix people into these categories that we have made them. And then we think we know all about someone. You know, we think we know all about someone because they're a particular nationality and they speak a particular language. We think we know all about someone uh, because they're a woman or because they're a man. Um, we think we know all about someone uh, whether, because of whether we like them or not. And I think what Dr. Ambeka realized at this moment is that all those ways of fixing people, all those ways of dividing people are created by mind and they never really had any existence. I think, um, and in terms of Buddhist philosophy, I'd say that he had a glimpse of what's called the Alia Vijnana. So the Alia Vijnana is, um, is the, uh, is the, Alia is like Himalaya, it means store or basis or abode. Um, and Vijnana means experience or consciousness. So in Buddhist philosophy, uh, consciousness is divided into eight parts and um, the Alia Vijnana is the kind of deepest part. So we have our experience, our consciousness divided into eight parts. The first, part, first six parts are um, our kind of sensory awareness. So things that the awareness of um, seeing or smelling or hearing or touching um, or tasting. There's also in Buddhism, um, the mind itself is, uh, called, is, is understood as a, a sense faculty. So there's also, just as we have the awareness of seeing something or hearing something, we have the awareness of thinking something, of thoughts arising in our mind. And um, so those are the first six uh, consciousnesses, six awarenesses. Um, the seventh awareness um, or consciousness is the klishta mana vijnana. So um, the klishta mana vijnana is that what's sometimes called the defiled or suffering mind consciousness. And this is the mind consciousness that divides things, that sees the things in terms of what we can get out of them, that divides things in terms of me and mine, subject and object, self and other. So from this point of view, this is the sort of ignorant mind that um, sees things purely in terms of self-interest, purely in terms of, um, will it, do I like it or not? Will it help me or not? Um, and this is the mind that divides. This is the mind out of which arises caste and all discrimination, all inequality in society. We've got a mind that's separating out that's seeing, does this person belong to my tribe or not? Are they other or are they with me? And we can see this mind in operation. Um, the Sangharachita gives a, a very beautiful story of he, him seeing a great tree with a friend. Uh, and his friend says, oh, that tree's um, really wonderful. And they're both standing there, they're looking at the tree thinking, yes, that's a really wonderful tree. And then his friend said, yes, it will give me firewood for a whole winter. Whereas Sangharachita was looking at the tree, just looking at the beauty of the tree in itself. So we can see here that that's what our mind's doing all the time. Our mind is looking for what we can get out of things. Um, it's dividing things into terms of whether we like it or not, whether it's helpful to us or not, whether we find it pleasurable or painful, whether it's self or other. And this is the mind where, um, where caste and all inequalities uh, derive from. But there's another possibility of consciousness, and that's the alia. This is the part of our awareness where that division doesn't take place, where we see things just as they are in themselves, when we just see existence as it is, as it arises, as it unfolds naturally, without tension or division. And it's said that we can experience this state of mind without division, just experiencing things as they arise naturally in awareness. We can get to that place when we've got um, what's called enough seeds, 
good seeds in our consciousness. So this is a, just an image. What it means is that every time that we do um, an ethical action, an action that's in line with reality, an action that's beautiful and kind and opening and expansive, every time we undertake that action, it leads, leaves a seed in our consciousness. And eventually those seeds ripen um, enough that we can see into a state of awareness without this defiled mind consciousness, without this divided mind consciousness. And I think in Mbeka's life, all that uh, early part of his life of um, discipline, of ethical behavior, of uh, dedication to his studies, had all put enough, in a way, positive seeds into his consciousness that ripened at that moment as a vision of existence without division, without tension, but just seeing that all humanity is one, all life is one, it's all just part of life, without dividing into self and other, without dividing into what I can get out of this experience or not. Um, Dr. Ambeka spent a long time reflecting, reflecting through his whole life. He really made reflecting um, a, a kind of meditation in the sense that uh, it was a discipline in itself. He read a lot and he reflected on what he'd read. He understood what he read. And um, in a way, all these things that he'd done over his life enabled a kind of um, veil to be lifted uh, away from purely kind of egotistic self-interest into a real seeing of what life really is and what the mind is capable of. Um, he could see with clarity that we're all just part of life, that we're all just trying to grow in our own way. And he had an awareness of people as they are um, without uh, a kind of... Um, tension or egotism of the klishto mano vinyana, the uh, defiled mind consciousness. And in a way, I think this is very reminiscent of the Buddha's experience when he was enlightened. Um, it said that when the Buddha, after his enlightenment experience, um, the eye of the Buddha opened and he saw all beings like lotuses emerging from the mud of existence and that some were near the surface of the water, just ripe to break free, where some were still struggling. But in a way, in the vision of that, he saw all beings as living, as growing, as stretching towards the light. Uh, the light. He saw that all of humanity is in that same predic predicament. We're all trying to grow towards the light. And it doesn't matter which caste or nationality or which language we speak, or how much, what level of education we have, we're all growing towards that light. And it's said that when the Buddha saw this, saw this vision of humanity, it said that he trembled, Anukampa, he trembled with all beings, he shook uh, with all beings, out of compassion for all beings. And of course, this is also Dr. Ambeka's experience that when he saw that all humanity was one, that caste is just a function of mind and has no objective reality, um, his answer to that was to a greater love. Um, he had a love for all humanity, a fellow feeling for all humanity, um, or as we call it in Buddhism, Maitri, love for all humanity. Um, he expressed them, this himself as a fraternity, a quality of fraternity. And he said, this is the disposition of an individual to treat men as the object of reverence and love and the desire to be in unity with his fellow beings. So this is what Dr. Ambedkar had. He had a desire to be in unity with his fellow beings. He had a desire to treat all beings with reverence and love and respect. He had a desire for all beings to grow towards their potential which he very much saw as enlightenment itself. And he saw that as he was suffering, he didn't want other people's, people to also suffer. He thought, well, if I'm suffering in this way and I've had all this education and possibility in my life, well, what's it going to be like for other people? What's it going to be like for the, uh, 
other people who are in the same position as me, from the same background as me. And this reminds me very much actually of something that an English poet, uh, Shelley, said. He said that the great secret of morals is love or a going out of our nature and an identification of ourselves with the beautiful, which exists in thought, action or person, not our own. Shelley said that a man to be greatly good must imagine intensely and comprehensively. He must put himself in the place of another and of many others. The pains and pleasures of his species must become his own. And we find this also in the Bodhicharya of Vitara. In the Bodhicharya of Vitara, uh, Shanti Davis says, why should I prioritize myself? Why should I only care about my own suffering? I am part of humanity, just as the hand is part of the body. Um, and because I'm part of humanity, I think about all of humanity and not just myself. So I think Dr. Ambeka really saw this. He really had a feeling for this. He had a feeling of, of respect and love for other pe beings because he saw that we're not separate. And why should he look after himself when he's part of humanity? Why should he only think about his own suffering when other people are suffering? What was so important about his own suffering that he should ignore the sufferings of others? So that's what uh, Dr. Ambeka did. He imaginatively identified with other living beings. He felt with other living beings. He felt with the members of his own community who he knew were suffering like himself. And he shook with them. He trembled with them. And this gave rise to action. Because Dr. Ambeka imaginatively identified with others, he wanted to help them. And this is real morality. This is the real action, the real ethical system. Um, ethics aren't uh, an action imposed on us by an external force or a parent or a God, but uh, in a way, ethical action, moral action is um, an expression of love, an expression of love that we act out in our lives. And this was expressed in Dr. Ambeka as a vow to liberate his people, a vow to, uh, to take into account to work for others who experienced the same as he did. It wasn't just about his own experience of suffering. He realized that all uh, the other people suffer in the same way and he made a vow to liberate them. Um, he made a vow to liberate other beings from the inequality that he was experiencing. And I don't think it was just about um, his own community. I think it started with his community, but he really did have that vision that he wanted to work the rest of his life um, liberating all inequality in the world. You know, he'd seen inequality in uh, the United States as well as um, in India. He'd seen the inequality of um, racial segregation as well as caste segregation. So he knew very well that inequality is something that happens in all societies. And he wanted to rid him, rid uh, the problem of inequality in the world. So in Buddhism, we would call this the Bodhisattva vow because the Bodhisattva is a being, sattva, or even a hero um, of Bodhi, of awakening. Um, and this is a being who vows to uh, spend the whole of their life to dedicate all their energy, uh, everything that they have in their life to liberating others. And um, it's not just an idea or it's not just a decision that one, make, one might make on a sort of Sunday afternoon or I think I'll help others. It actually emerges out of a very, very deep spiritual experience like a jewel is forged deep underground when many forces collide, the Bodhisattva vow emerges when one's whole being, one's whole heart and mind turn towards helping other beings, turn towards the liberation of other living beings from all kinds of suffering. We're not just talking about helping them materially. Um, the Bodhisattva vows to liberate all beings from suffering whatsoever and to enable all beings to have the conditions uh, 
uh, to reach enlightenment. And this is such a strong and intense kind of feeling that um, is sometimes called, it's, it emerges when the forces of wisdom and love collide, when that real seeing that all human beings, um, all humanity is one, collides with that great love for all human beings. Um, and these are great underground forces that give rise to energy, that give rise to this momentum and this serious vow of, I will spend the rest of my life helping to liberate others. In Buddhism, we call this the pranidhana. And I know some of you will have uh, noticed that word from another context, because Dr. Ambeka also, um, when he formally took up uh, the Buddhist path, he asked his followers and he took himself 20 pranidhanas, 20 vows um, on, how to, um, on how to become a Buddhist and how to live a Buddhist life. I'm a member of the Tree Ratna Buddhist order. And we also take uh, the 10 precepts, which uh, Sangharachita called our 10 vows. And he said to me personally about those vows, he said that an order member must remember these are very, very serious things that we undertake, um, that we should never break the vows that we have taken. And in a way they're serious because they integrate us. They give us focus, uh, not just for this life, but for all our lives. Um, in, uh, in, the Buddh in the Buddhist, uh, in Buddhist philosophy, in the Buddhist system of life, uh, to make a vow with this kind of in intensity is the steering force in our lives. Um, it's what integrates our lives. It was, it, it, it's an expression of what gives our life meaning and purpose all throughout our lives. It's like with these vows, they're the kind of um, engine on the back of a boat and the steering column on the back of the boat. This is what's going to power us through not just this life, but all lives. And if we make that vow seriously, it integrates us. It shows us where our life is going. So this is what happened to Dr. Ambeka. Um, his wisdom, his love, his energy gave rise to a faith gave rise to a faith that he expressed in a vow. And the faith that he had is that it is possible for people to grow and develop. It is possible for people to flourish in wisdom and compassion. And um, it is possible that inequality can be removed from the world. I find this remarkable. It's such an optimistic vision you know, when there's so much inequality, there's so much difficulty in the world, um, that Dr. Ambeka could have had a vision of a possibility of an India without caste, with a world without inequality. Because he saw that what the mind creates, the mind can undo. The mind creates inequality. The mind crea creates caste, class, divisions, nationalism, all uh, racism, all these uh, sort of fruits of inequality are created in the mind. And what the mind can create, the mind can undo. So Dr. Ambenka spent the rest of his life trying to do undo inequality. He tried with political work. Um, he uh, formed journals, he formed a political party. He tried with social action. Um, he became the law minister of a newly independent in, um, India, and he drafted the Constitution of India, which is a, a document of great beauty. And he did so much for India and so much for his people. I, I know that many people say, and I, and I believe it is true, that Dr. Ambeka liberated people from slavery, millions of people from slavery. He enabled um, reservations um, for people who could not get access to uh, jobs in government or in ed higher education. He wrote the constitution of in in India, but he said of himself, it wasn't enough. He said the constitution of India is like a palace on a dung heap because it's only as good as the people who put it into practice. And in the end, he said, um, we need Buddhism. We need Buddhism because it directly uh, works on the mind itself. 
And that's where inequality comes from. It comes from vinyana, it comes from consciousness, it comes from the mind. Um, and he said that cultivation of mind should be the ultimate aim of human existence. So Dr. Ambedkar had tremendous energy and drive. He fulfilled his vow. He worked through the night. He had knockback after knockback after knockback, and he carried on. He never gave up the struggle right until he um, drew his last breath. And he made a huge difference to millions of people's lives. He emancipated them from slavery. He uh, gave India and the world the Indian constitution, which is a thing of great beauty and dignity. Um, he gave people their self-respect and dignity and he communicated wisdom and love and gave people the means to realize that from them, for themselves. So what about us? What about us? What can we learn from, from Dr. Ambeka and this time of Dr. Ambeka? Well, we're also in a time of struggle and difficulty. We're in a time of uncertainty. There's the actual suffering of people who are ill, who are dying, um, who are lacking in food or sanitation. And we've got the suffering of change. We've got uh, our plans that we held so dearly, that we imagined so vividly, our plans dissolving. Um, we're separated from our loved ones. You know, and it's not the same being able to phone someone up. I haven't seen my parents for um, a couple of months now. And, you know, I, we're human beings. I want to hold my mother. I want to hold my father. I want to see my friends. It's not the same just being able to ring them up. And, you know, we're locked in with the same people. I know many of you are, are locked up in quite small spaces um, with lockdown with your family. And much as we love our family and our friends, whoever we're living with, tensions can arise. You know, I live in a community of um, nine people and we love each other dearly and tensions can arise. So these are the suffering of change, the suffering of... Uh, of um, seeing an imagined future and realizing that actually it's not possible. Um, we're living in an unequal world. There's so much more work to do um, in terms of inequality. I've heard it said um, by our government in, in the West that um, COVID-19, coronavirus, is the great leveler. It's not the great leveler. It disproportionately affects people who are migrant workers, who have unstable jobs, or low paid jobs. It, it, uh, in, in Europe, it's very, dis and, and the United States of America, it's very much disproportionately affecting the ethnic minorities. It disproportionately affects people who can't physically isolate and who can't get access to food or sanitation. It's not that everyone is experiencing this equally. And inequalities are showing up in all societies, India, Europe, uh, United States of America, because um, the coronavirus affects much uh, people, much some people much more than others. So here is our adverse conditions. Here they are, and like Dr. Ambeka, we have to let that uh, struggle meet faith, meet a substantial response to come into contact with that kind of adversity. So. Um, through that uh, meeting, the struggle with faith, something really remarkable can emerge, that vow to help all living beings. So how do we deepen our faith? We deepen our faith by deepening uh, our wisdom and, and love, Maitri. Um, we need to use these conditions to deepen our wisdom that we're all part of one humanity and that humanity is essentially one that divisions are made in the mind only, and what the mind can create, the mind can undo. And to do that, I think we need to spend some time, like Dr. Ambedkar, um, reflecting or being still. Uh, experience the mind before it gets busy creating um, divisions. You can see the mind busy at work. You can see the mind categorizing things, putting things into sections. We need some experience of the mind before that happens. 
So if we can find that in meditation, that's wonderful. Not everyone has the conditions for a meditation at the moment, but some people do. If you can find that just by sitting still for some time and reflecting, that's great. Um, if you can find some time uh, for reading and reflecting, that will be very good too. Like Baba Saheb, a lot of his reflections came through a kind of deep reading. Um, I would suggest, uh, particularly to my brothers and sisters in India, that we bring out our copy of uh, the Buddha and his Dharma and read some of that, read sections from that. It doesn't have to be long. You don't need hours to do it. But if we read one section a day, we can reflect on it with that section in all our activities. And we can even um, uh, encourage, if it's possible, encourage the people that we're locked down with to encourage us in, in, in this um, endeavor, you know, to help us say, let's have some quiet time for meditation together as a household, which is what we, we do here. I know it's not possible for everyone, but if we can do something, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. It has to take discipline of the mind. And also to encourage our maitri to imaginatively identify with other, other people. You know, what's this like for, for others? What's it like for the other people that I'm in contact with at the moment? And really listening to each other. We're not alone in this. We're not even alone in the UK or in India. Um, uh, I think it's something like half the world is locked down at the moment. So bringing all these people to mind and imagining their situations as well as our own. And of course, there's energy, um, applying energy to help other people as much as we can. So I know that many people in India are um, engaged with um, enabling people to have food and sanitation, uh, particularly uh, those who are really struggling at the moment. Um, we can give that, we can give material things, we can give time and energy to people, we can phone people up who need that us. Um, we can give what in Buddhism is the gift of fearlessness, the gift of encouragement and confidence. And we can give the gift of the Dharma where possible. And we're not alone in this, you know, Baba Saheb uh, had to do all of this on his own, but we don't have to do it on our own. We can join with others locally. There's many Sangha initiatives I know taking place, particularly helping people in, uh, in difficult situations in India. So we can find out what's happening and join in with that. So just to finish, um, I wanted to say, well, it's said in Buddhism that the lotus arises from the mud. It doesn't arise when everything's going well. It doesn't come from a, a clean river. And this is a special time that humanity is facing. Sometimes we talk about going back to things as they were before, but I don't think we have to go back to things as they were before. I think we can imagine a new possibility. I think we can create a possibility. Um, in a way, I think this is a kind of time when the veils are removed and we can see humanity in all its horror, but also its glory of what communities are capable of when we come together and work together as one. Um, what is possible when we act with wisdom and love, when we allow wisdom and love to come together and we're not just retreating into ourselves and looking after only ourselves. Um, Baba Saheb himself said, uh, you know, um, have faith in yourself. With justice on our side, I do not see how we can lose our battle. The battle to me is a matter of joy. The battle is in the fullest sense spiritual. There is nothing material or social in it. For ours is a battle not for wealth or for power. It is a battle for freedom. It is a battle for the reclamation of the human personality. The human personality will flourish if it's given the right conditions. There is a possibility of not just hatred and aversion when um, the human personality comes across difficult circumstances. There is a possibility for wisdom and love and faith when we meet difficult circumstances. And if we deepen our um, spiritual practice and we deepen our practice of um, helping others, that's what can happen. 
adverse conditions can give rise to this vow, um, this maha sankalpa, um, this great determination to make our lives meaningful, to put our lives at the service of the well-being of humanity. And we can do that. We can use this circumstance for um, these, this difficult time for really helping others and for setting ourselves this clear, meaningful, generous and beautiful determination in our lives. So brothers and sisters, when this is over, if I'm still alive and I still have uh, any money to do it, let's have a program in Gujarat. Let's have a program at that bench. Um, let's celebrate the vow that Dr. Ambedkar made and remember the vow that Dr. Ambedkar made and see that vow reflected in our own hearts. Let's have a program in Gujarat and uh, remember the vow. Always remember the vow that Dr. Ambedkar made. So I'd like to finish uh, with um, the Bodhisattva vows that Dr. Ambedkar put at the end of the Buddha and his Dharma, his great work. And there's a reason that he put those vows there. They put those vows there because they meant something to him, because he lived by those vows, because those vows were expressed in everything that he did. There are beings without limit. Let us take the vow to convey them all across. There are depravities in us without number. Let us take the vow to extinguish them all. There are truths without end. Let us take the vow to comprehend them all. There is the way of the Buddha without comparison. Let us take the vow to accomplish it perfectly. Thank you.